This segment is to talk specifically about this gentleman and this guitar, okay? Because it's an exceptional guitar and he's quite an exceptional chap. Um, his name is Simon and he lives in the north of England and we are visiting his premises, uh, surrounded by some lovely amps and some nice guitars. Um, and I guess my first question for you is your sort of background. I mean, we, we have this strange distinction where we actually attended the same school together, not at quite the same time, but... Um, so we have that common bond as well. But after that, how did, what, how did you get into music and wh what did you follow? I Well, um, like I suppose everybody in the, in the late 60s, mid to late 60s, loved anything to do with bands. Spencer Davis, particularly Stevie Winwood, yeah. was a great uh, inspiration. And then it was only later that I heard Eric Clapton and Blues Breakers. Funnily enough, it was uh, the Fresh Cream that I heard first, ah. and then the Blues Breakers. And I just thought, what a fantastic sound. Yeah. I haven't got a clue. And then somebody said this magic word, Les Paul, and I, I assumed that was a make. Right. I didn't realise it was anything yeah. to do with Gibson or yeah. whatever. And, uh, and the first time I actually saw one was, um, was very... Uh, very early Fleetwood Mac at Southport Floral Hall oh. uh, with just the four of them. Right. And uh, I've never seen such a ramshackle bunch of guys. With so sort of Mick Fleetwood, John, John McVie, McVie uh, Spen Peter Green and Danny Cohen. No, oh, no Jeremy Spencer. Uh, Jeremy Spencer. Before Danny Cohen. Oh, yeah. And <sighs> all the amps were sort of torn, yeah. bits of fabric Real flapping Real road-worn. Oh, yeah. And um, McVie... Looked, he Probably looked, he looked bugger all. mean yeah. uh, with a black leather jacket. Yeah. And the sort of guy that he thought, right, I don't want to get on the wrong side. Okay. Of you. okay. But I've never heard such a wonderfully clear, fabulous sound. Well, and let's face it, BB King's on your side on that uh, one. Oh, uh, and and you, the separation and the and the clarity right. was just wonderful. Okay. And then just Peter, uh, Peter Green sort of started off. Uh, what the hell? Oh, Lost Another Woman or something yeah. like that, but yeah. sort of heavily drenched front pickup, Les Paul, whatever. And that's when Greeny looked very, very pink. Uh -huh. And uh, I couldn't get over the funny, sh the, the sort of shape of it because it was sort of elongated, much mm. less round. Well, it sort of, I suppose guitars were much more sort of, the, the, you know, much more round. Fatter and jacket. more wasted, yeah. weren't they? Yeah. 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 Um, yes, and um, I think from that moment on, I wanted to play and I wanted um, to well eventually have Les Paul but so un like unlike me you know I you know I did do music for a short while but I realized it wasn't, <coughs> I wasn't quite up to it and all the rest of it so I pursued a business career but you actually then became a musician and, and were in quite an interesting outfit well for, yeah for a long time. I, I, I sort of blagged I, actually I blagged my way through life basically <laughs> Uh, but, we all? Um, yeah, I was in a band with a very good mate, uh, Tony Bowers, who later for his sins was very much involved with, well, he was a bass player with Simply Red. Um, right. But very much involved with a sort of Manchester cooperative uh, where you would all pool gear. And at that time, clubs, it was very different. There were very few venues around. There was largely coffee bars and there was an extremely right wing 
police constable, Mr. Anderton, ah. Anderson, Anderton, Anderton, wasn't he? Who was? He was quite famous. Yes, he was. He hard was, line, and he had got a bit of religion, so he was yeah. pretty hard line. And th- there weren't a lot of gigs around. But however, Music Force did manage to get a circuit together. They pulled amps, whatever, and we um, yeah, lent ours and and sort of did PA, and and they also acted as an agency. And then the very very fledgling Alberto Elostrius Paranoius, which was largely three people, uh, Chris Lee, Jimmy Hibbert and Bob Hardy. And they just did largely sketches. But then uh, they sort of slowly gathered one or two musicians around them. It was never on a permanent basis. But as, as it slowly did solidify into personnel and the original... Um, show was largely of the sort of history of rock and roll and there was a definite country section as well as the sort of rock and roll and then the sort of pop and uh, and sort of beat group and whatever and then by I suppose the late 60s the country was starting to come into it and I played a bit of lap steel and and insisted that they needed a lap steel player and so that's how I... That was your gateway into it? Yeah I got in and I knew one or two of them anyhow and, and they, they became, basically, I, I'm going to try and choose my words carefully here, because th- there is quite a rich tradition of kind of humour in pop music. Yeah. Going well, back, I mean, and there was the Baron Knights in the 60s yeah. who kind of cloned <clears throat> in an entertaining way singles, current singles. That's right. And then there were bands like the Bonzo Dogs and so yeah. on. But you too, you were, on, you were on the precipice of serious music, pastiche, and humour, yeah, weren't you? Yeah, oh, we were satirical, we were piss take. We'd do where um, Lou, did, was it Lou Reed did heroin or whatever? We did Anadin. Okay. And uh, where Hendrix would do the Star Spangled Banner in a very feedbacked manner, I would do the Archers theme tune in a, in a <laughs> hopefully a similar sort of fashion. Be- because, I mean, you, 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 you know, suddenly they got to a point, I mean, you really got recognition, you got a record contract. Yeah. And, and you started touring, you started mm-hmm. appearing in London. I was aware of you. Then you start touring abroad and stuff like that. No, it's, 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 it's miraculous. How did it happen? Well, but it's fantastic. <laughs> and, 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 well, you, and, you know, it's, it, this, this is a meritocracy. If your music shit, you're going to bomb. <laughs> well, we had some very, very good support bands. We had... Uh, <laughs> That's generous. That helps. <laughs> yeah. Well, we had Any, anybody really. Uh, you had the police. We wow. Had, uh, Blondie, we certainly played on. Stranglers oh, uh, um, were, were a support band. Um, oh, and various other things. Um, uh, and also, I mean, we were lucky because nobody would. Uh, you you couldn't get record contracts yeah. for love and money. So, um, stiff records came along. Jake, Rivi- Andrew, Jake, Jake Riviera, and Dave Robinson, who'd done the wonderful um, Brinsley Schwartz hype over to L.A., which was a story in itself. Uh, uh, They decided they were going to set up the uh, one of the first, well, if not the first independent record company, which was right underneath our management's premises. So so, so you were originally on Transatlantic. Yep. Uh, but then they were the only people that would have us. Well, but they did, and that's important. And Transatlantic in the day were a bit like Island or Vertigo or Harvest. I mean, they were notable labels with a roster of pretty serious bands. But then you migrated onto Stiff, and that's that's a feather in the cap to be on Stiff. Well, we were actually on both because I think we did we did also still stay with Transatlantic. Only oh, no, I think it became Logo then. Okay. But it was basically okay. the same thing as far as I remember. But yeah, that that, that was good, and, and we did the. Well, Nick Lowe did the first uh, stiff EP, but we did a second. And we had, so our, our 10 minutes of glory were around about 77. And we okay. had a, a good, good show called Snuff Rock, which did extremely well. At and, the, you, and you had a long residency at, in the Royal Court Theatre? Royal Court Theatre, which then... Serious London theatre. Yeah, and we, we did actually break box office records there. Um, for the longest or most successful? For just Yeah, for seats. And wow. Whatever. And then it transferred to the Roundhouse. And then, Another iconic location. Yeah, we were there, I think, for about a couple of months or so. Wow. And, and I think our last night was, was, uh, was memorable because Nick Lowe, who was a, a good mate at that stage, and he, would, he was around a lot, and especially 
slightly earlier than that. Uh, is it the Newlands Tavern? I don't know if there was something like that, 100 Club and places like that. Yeah. Eventually that came to an end. You pursued a different career. Yeah. Right? To kind of put a roof Most over Most bands uh, dissolve through musical differences. Yes. We, d we d went our way through musical indifference. Okay. Okay. But then... Alongside, well, not so long later, but you stuck with the guitar all the oh, way through. Oh, yeah, I always loved guitars. And you acquired guitars, and one of the guitars you acquired quite a long time ago, decades ago, was the one you're holding. Yep, 40 years ago. Which is, tell us about this. Well, start on, uh, somebody broke into my flat, uh, stole all my guitars, apart from the blue one, which you uh, which you've the seen The blue Strat, yeah. right. I don't know what he's got against slapboard straps, but... <laughs> Seriously, he left that alone. Thank goodness. Goodness. Um, so I had the one sensible thing I had done was uh, insure my instruments, and, and I got a, a reasonable insurance right. check okay. at that time, which allowed me to then I Potter. Well, I was still looking for instruments because we were still playing and, yep. and busy. And um, so you went shopping. I went shopping, and I saw this hanging up in. Guitar Grapevine in Denmark Place, which was at the back. I think it's now William Hill. Yeah. Or uh, Orange also, I think. And do I recall, you actually saw another guitar hanging up there as well, didn't you? Yes, I did. There were, t there were Well, there was another Les Paul, which it didn't, I, didn't appeal to me in quite the same way that this did. I don't quite know why. I think it was a sort of... This had a sort of a, an older vibe about it, but the other one was very, very um, flame, highly flamed, and had been Peter Green's, not his Greeny guitar, mm. but another, another, a, a later one, and also uh, um, uh, hanging on the wall, which I bought about five or six days later with my insurance money, was the uh, uh, fifty-five Strat. So you've got a fifty-nine Les Paul well, and a fifty-five Strat on a shopping trip. On a shopping trip. Not a bad afternoon's no. work, if and I And in might fact, say. what it did, it cleaned out a rather indifferent set of guitars. And replaced and them with exceptional. Well, yeah. it started the basis of something. But then, of course, this guitar, it turns out, it, this guitar has a story, because this belonged to Mick Taylor of the Rolling Stones. I was told after I bought it, you might be interested to know where this came from. God, haven't times changed? You were told after you bought it. Now, yeah. Yeah. they'd be smothering you with it. Yeah, it was after I bought it. Because uh, at that time, it was a second-hand guitar, <laughs> which is what yeah. I was looking for. Yeah. He said, well, you, you might be interested to know this. Wow. This, uh, got this from Mick Taylor. And he said, "There's the it has got marks on it. It could be the big speed, yeah. uh, the, the Keefe one, yeah. which... Uh, I later discovered. Well, I checked out. I started check, looking at photographs, and I realised that it wasn't. Yeah, because they've all got a kind of fingerprint in, in yeah. the in the wood, haven't yeah. they? In the flame, yeah. yeah. And really, never really thought much more about it uh, for quite a long time. And it was only probably about fifteen years later, or something like that. I just thought to look. I'm. I really should try and check out whether that story had any legs. Um, whether it's true or not, and, and then started hunting around, trying to find photographs, which eventually I did. Um, and I realised that this flame mark here yes. is a very significant thing, and yeah. it's an instant sort of uh, ver so. verification. Yeah, of it, and, and you've got quite a file of... of Kind of verification and stuff, some, yeah. of, some of which we might, with your permission, kind of yeah. just to take a quick snap and extract from. Uh, what we're looking at here is a 1959 Les Paul, um, and what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm, go I'm, I'm going to do the, the, the typical British pessimist thing. I'm going to actually point to the exceptions rather than the rules. Okay, so it's a straight guitar, except for what I'm about to talk about. And by straight, I, I'm, I'm not going to say bad things. I'm going to say things that are different. The first thing is, as Simon's already pointed out, there are these two marks here. They're known as a snake bite, and they indicate the two screw holes of a Bigsby, which would have been fixed at the bottom. Yeah, they've got little holes at the bottom to show. So this has had a Bigsby on it at some point in its life. And it's an ex Rolling Stones guitar, but you've established from the fingerprint of the mm. flame mm. that it's not the Keefe burst. Mm. But it was nevertheless a burst within the perimeter of the Rolling Stones that had a Bigsby on it at one point in time. So yeah. you know that? Yeah. Uh, everything to me is looking right and okay. The tailpiece, the knobs, the everything here. I was looking earlier while you were talking, and I'd, I hadn't noticed before. These pickups are still relatively square on the corners. Now, my pickups here, I'm just going to put this in place for a minute, are also very square on the corners. This is a 58. And 
in my experience, the pickups start very square in 58, they round slightly in 59, they continue to round through 60 into the shape that most people know about humbuckers. So if you're really expert about things, you can see that these are very likely, to, they're, they're certainly authentic covers, and I imagine that there's a good chance that these covers have never been removed from the pickups underneath. They have. They have. <laughs> I've shifted them. <laughs> so, OK, and therefore you know what's underneath them. That's double white. Whoa, and... That one, I think... Well, my friend Steve Clark, who's very good on these things, he did a, a piece about it, and we took it to pieces and looked at all sorts of things. Yeah. That pickup has been changed. Ah. It's, it's a very early path yes. without a, a, a sticker because we, he established right. he's got the long magnet. Right. Also... And it's therefore going to be double black bobbins. It's, if it's double black. One. Yes. But it's off a, a possibly a jazz guitar because the cover of this cover yeah. won't fit on there. Ah. It's slightly narrower. Also, the cans are <laughs> from a gold top. Ah. So we think that in in there's lots of parts uh, on a Rolling Stones tour or whatever, yes. and they're just putting in parts yes. and what, fitting things around yes. or whatever. So these are definitely genuine fifties pickups. That's almost certainly original. To original and native. Yes. Yeah. This one isn't. Right. Interesting. But is of the right period or even slightly earlier. Okay. Why we don't know. Okay. But they have this this gold ring here. Yeah is obviously not native to the guitar native, because it's gold but it's yeah. and similarly these ah and yes yes those gold thumb wheels yeah. right okay so we've got all sorts of little quirks. so ordinarily if this was going through the hands of you know a, a, a dealer who was being slightly economical yeah. for the truth they'd probably do little replacements mm -hmm. on this but given the provenance of this instrument you don't mess with anything on this no, at all no this this is how it came right so it was done either prior to Mick Taylor getting... He actually... Uh, my understanding is that uh, when the instruments... They were, uh, were stolen from Nelcott, I think it was, in the south of right. France. Yeah. They'd done most of the recording, uh, but there were some overdubs to be done in, in L.A., which they did. And somebody was sent out to... For, uh, on Mick Taylor's behalf, and he bought two Les Pauls. One, uh, this is one of them, and the other one was a planer one which has quite often got um, the, the covers removed uh -huh. so I think you uh, uh, he possibly had four ah. through his okay through his okay um, and so maybe moving more. moving down the guitar the guitar the, the, the thing that's nice about 59s over 58s is that these are skinny frets those are fat frets yeah but those this this guitar's been refreshed it has been yeah definitely and I mean given the wear it's had it's probably been refreshed more than once mm. nevertheless that the, the the fingerboard is not too pitted. There's a little bit of pitting yeah, up yeah. here, but everything else. D the major itis. Everything right. There's the D major itis. D major itis. Uh, and, and and you can see there's various bits of re uh, replacement here. Yes. Yep. That segment is certainly a replacement, replacement piece. So some of yeah. the binding has has yeah. gone, as sometimes happens. The other thing is this guitar has been hasn't been subject to much climatic change. Yeah. So it's pretty stable. But if you put these in. America, where the climate can change dramatically, or you stick it in aeroplanes and stuff like that, it, the wear and tear mm. is considerable. Yeah. So the the nut is it's still nylon, like it should be. Yeah. Not bone. So but it's it, quite high, isn't it's it? It's quite high. It it doesn't look original, but it yeah. looks of the correct material. Yeah. And let's face it, that's another of what we would call. Um, uh, oh God, what what's the the word they use for? This is a consumable. Consum Okay. It's, it's, it's something it, 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 that wears. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like a brake consumer. pad. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, it would be quite unusual for a, war a guitar that's as worn as this to have an original nut. Yeah. So there's no offence there, but it, at least it's the original kind of white nylon. Yeah. Um, the truss rod cover is obviously fine. The, the most interesting deviation from normal on this guitar is the headstock. Two things going on. First of all, like many of these, it's been modified to accept Grover tuners which was a popular mod of the time, because mm. people like the, the accuracy and all the rest of it. And also, these things were beginning already to yeah. crack up on certain guitars. Um, but what it does mean is that the holes for the tuners have been routed out because Grover's got bigger shafts. In fact, when I got it, it had shallows on it. Right. And somebody said, oh, you want to get you want to get Grover's on that. You so, certainly do. So I put Grover's on. Yeah. I've still got the shallows. Oh, shallows like on the Peter Green guitar? 
No, that's, is it spritz? Spurzels. Spurzels, you're right, you're right. I wanted to say spritzels. Spurzels. <laughs> spurzels are very modern. They, they have no heritage. Yeah, but they, they were on the um, Peter Green for guitar. I think Gary on Moore. On the Greeny? I think yeah. Gary yeah. Moore put them on there. Right. He, took, he took these yeah. ones off and put the. Yeah. the because, I mean, because they're lockable. Possibly. Yeah. I mean, they're terribly convenient, but they are so non. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, right, moving on. But the other thing, the most interesting deviation about this guitar is you look, and the headstock is notably mm. smaller. It's been shaved down on the sides. Well, and yeah, and it's had certainly. As you can see, you know, there's work. Well, something has happened to, yes. the, to the to the neck. The texture, the texture of the the, the 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 most of the neck looks looks pretty fine to me. It's up here. The texture behind here changes. Yeah. So uh, it's not broken, but uh, something it's been uh, shaved, possibly shaved. I don't know, or but certainly something's happened. Yeah, and it's lost its Les Paul silk screen although although that could be for a different reason because yeah. the silk screen is is put on after the paintwork right and it's only it's a very <clears> thin <throat> sprayed silk screen so these can wear off if if you're the kind of guitarist who cleans his guitar fairly regularly it's going to wear off in no time okay. so that's quite that's common close. um either through wear and tear or, or, or so something's been going on with the headstock here now you know the mythology you know greeny itself the famous most famous les paul that was broken mm. here, mm. and they do say that you know the um, th these days when you repair a guitar, the glue's better than the wood. Yeah. And Peter Green always said that actually the guitar rang and sound be sounded mm. better when it came back from the mender. I'd better go and break this one then. Well, but if that has been broken, <laughs> I mean it's no, it it's it's, yeah. it's no cost the sound at all. And again, that to on this guitar, that kind of feature yeah. to a collector would be a definite down mark. But yeah. because of this guitar's history. It transcends all of that. That thing. would have happened in their ownership because it's not yeah. happened in my ownership. And I, as far as I'm aware, I was the next owner. And just a quick. Let's have a quick look at the back. It's oh a, yes, there's another another little sort of giveaway thing. Yes, yeah. is there is a. Uh, it's always had a strap button there. A strap button there, which is really interesting. And I've got a picture of it with the strap button. Have you? With Mick Taylor. Uh, in, uh, I, well, I don't know whether he's in the picture or not. I, actually, I've got lots of pictures with Keith holding and using it. He used it quite a lot. I think they weren't they weren't very particular about right. who used what. They just grabbed. Well, uh, in much the same way as the Beatles all used yeah, to, yeah. you know, pick up the old six string bass or, or the the J one sixty or whatever. They yeah, they just moved around. Probably got yeah. more in my. Sort of file of them. So yeah. I've probably got more pictures of Keith playing this or holding right. it. Or handling well, that's it not bad. There. Then, then, uh, Great provenance again. Yeah, and everything else about it. You know, the, the, so my my uh, heel is very slightly more C shaped. Yours is slightly flatter, which befits the fifty nine. By sixty, it's very flat across mm. here. So that's that's right and and everything too. And not much wear across the back. Slightly less than mine actually. So quite clean on the back. And again, the cherry has gradually faded and gone to a kind of barley sugar yeah. colour, which is all right and proper. Probably means that Keith didn't didn't play a lot because he did like a belt, didn't he? Oh yeah. I mean, he played it a lot, but he didn't play it for a long time. So. Right. Okay. Or maybe he <laughs> well, played it. Maybe he did. Studio sitting down, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. So you know, I mean, the, the, the guitar is more, more or less all together. But I'm, as I say, I'm having a nitpick because actually, the, where this guitar has been takes it into a different league, and it does. It plays and sounds amazing. Hmm. As I think we're about to find out, because Ramon is going to play us out on this segment hmm. um, with a little tune of his. Uh -huh. So I think all that remains for me to say is, Simon, thank you for letting us, you know, into your place and seeing this fabulous instrument and having a good old chin wag <laughs> about this kind of stuff and a geek out. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Otherwise, I'd have been gardening. <laughs> <laughs> it's a better option. Good. <laughs>